Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, we're really honored and privileged today to have uh, really a top pro professional producer with us. And uh, with Fred Mullen, he's had a great career and has a great career. He's got a record label that he started recently as well. Uh, we'll talk about him. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, I just want to thank our mutual friend Mario Biferali from Godan for connecting us. And uh, also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and subscribe to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below and click the bell. That helps out. I'll tell you a little bit about Fred's background and we'll get into it. He's a very successful record producer, well-known film and television composer. His early success as a record producer in the late 70s was producing numerous albums and singles, including the Grammy Award nominated, hugely popular song at that time, Sometimes When We Touch by Dan Hill. In the early 80s, Fred was based both out of L.A. and Toronto, and he began a 17-year run as a composer for TV and film. His work has run the gamut from award-winning dramas, adventure, and science fiction to Friday the 13th TV series and movies, and major TV series like Beverly Hills 90210 and the tabloid news show Hard Copy. In 2001, he moved to Nashville to produce and arrange albums, working on successful projects with the great songwriter Jimmy Webb, Chris Christopherson, Johnny Mathis, which he got two Grammy nominations for, the band America, J.D. Souther, great songwriter, Rita Wilson, and Lamont Dozier's album Reimagination, which was basically a retrospective of all his greatest hits. Fred spent five years producing duets with artists including Billy Joel, Vince Gill, Willie Nelson, Natalie Cole, Linda Ronstadt, Mark Knopfler, Chris Cornell, Jackson Brown, and other popular artists. As an artist, Fred's solo projects includes Disney's Lullaby album, which was Billboard Magazine's second best children's sell, second best selling children's album in 2001, and a gold record as, as, on top of that, as well as over 30 other album projects from Dis, for Disney from 2001 till now. In 2007 and 2008, he became VP of A and R for Walt Disney Records in California. And along with his executive duties, he was also executive producer of Disney's High School Musical, The Concert, Disney Mania 5, and Disney Channel Holiday, as well as producing Billy Ray Cyrus's hit album, Home at Last, which included the certified gold single, which charted at number two, called Ready, Set, Don't Go, which was a duet between Billy Ray and his daughter, Miley. In 2009, Fred returned to Nashville as his home base, which is where he is now, and he became a freelancer again, along with retaining his career and life as a dual citizen in Toronto, Canada. I think it's good to be a dual citizen as many places as possible nowadays. You, know? possible, yeah. you never know where you need to escape. Uh, Fred also runs a record company, Melody Place, <clears throat> which has a distribution agreement in place with BMG, and he continues working in the film and TV arena, especially music supervision and direction, as well as writing title themes and songs. Hey, Fred, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate your time. I, whoever you were talking about sounded really, uh, uh, really good. It's an impressive, dude, isn't it? I, I wish it was me. <laughs> hey, um, you're a guitar player as yes. well as being a producer. So I was curious, like, what? How did you first get started in the music business in general? Like, whether it's guitar or producing, what was your first break? Well, uh, you know, I had started um, uh, young. Uh, you know, my my older siblings had turned me on to rock and roll, um, early rock and roll. So I probably wanted to be Elvis Presley at age six. And then, um, you know, uh, folk music was happening and my sister had a nylon string guitar and I started to pick up some folk songs. But I was also playing drums. Uh, uh, that was my first love. And I played drums in uh, a junior high school band. And then um, uh, the Beatles hit when I was 11. And I saw that the drummer was in the back and the guitar players were in the front and they were getting all the attention. <laughs> and I, I, I said, I think I'm gonna, gonna be one of the guys in the front. Um, and I started to grow my hair long and I started to write songs and play electric guitar. And um, I had my bands and, you know, and then um, I quit school when I was 16 uh, uh, to pursue music because um, the first day I turned 16, my mother and I walked into Calhoun High School in Merrick, Long Island, and I signed the papers and I was free as a bird um, to wow. pursue my music. And I really, uh, I never regretted that it was the best decision I ever made. And, um, you know, I got a head start. Um, I started to do my own sort of singer songwriter thing on acoustic guitar. And then by age 17, I had moved to Toronto where my brother was living. 
Um, and it was a wide open city. And for the first year, all the doors in New York City were closed to me. I didn't know anyone. Uh, I was trying to get a record deal. And um, I went to Toronto to visit Larry. I never left because I got there and I was, I had a record deal. I had college gigs, I had a girlfriend. And I just told my parents, send some of my shit up here. because You know, I I'm not coming home. And I became a land and immigrant right there, which is sort of a, a green card scenario. Right. And then years later, when I could become a dual citizen, I became a dual citizen of Canada but uh, and the U.S. So that's really my professional uh, uh, start. And then in Toronto is where I, you know, started to play gigs as a singer-songwriter. And then things morphed. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, at that point, my, my main instrument was my Martin D-28. Wow. How did your, your mom was that supportive of you quit that's unusual to have like parents that support i have heard other guys say that but it's very yeah, infrequent yeah, I, I was very fortunate my mom who just passed away at 101 and a half um, and i condole I, I uh, thank, thank you thank you but she had an incredible run um she was my uh you know my great support my father was great because he was supportive too but he was busy and uh, working hard for the family and uh, didn't have as much you know interaction um, but he was, you know, reasonably positive, not as positive about my success as my mother was, but my mother felt that I could do no wrong and, and she was, uh, she understood. So it was wonderful. You were the youngest? I was the youngest. I was a baby. Of how many? Three. My brother's uh, seven years older. My sister's 11 years old. You know what, too, man? Some of that could have been that positioning because like, you know, you've got two, I've got three. By the third, you're like, man, you don't resist. It's like you don't want to resist. It's so much easier to say, yeah, man. It's like. Oh, are you easy. kidding me? I, I had it easy, man, because my parents were tired. Yeah, that's part of Yeah, you're exhausted by the third. It's like. Yeah, that, yeah that, believe me. That, that, and plus it was seven years later. They were, they were tired. Yeah, man. Well, good for you. It all worked. <laughs> um, how did you first transition? And what was the prompt to transition from musician you know, singer, songwriter, musician to production? Well, I was playing gigs in Toronto and um, I was playing them uh, constantly in the clubs. Uh, it was a very active singer, songwriter scene then. It was like 1974, I would say, uh, 73, 74. And one of the people that I would always be on the same, <clears throat> sort of playing the same clubs with, it was a guy named Dan Hill, who was about a year younger than me. And um, he was quite good. And uh, um, I was more sort of, I did a, almost a sit down, stand up, as well as sing and, and write. Um, so I was sort of known as sort of a, more of an entertainer uh, than some of these sensitive, you know, songwriters. Um, the folkies. You know, I, I actually, I'll do a quick moment here. You know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, one of the great things, Craig, is that. Um, playing the same clubs at that time was a guy named Raffi. And um, he sucked. Raffi? Raffi. Like and the guy who... The Armenian... Yeah. Raffi. And he would, he would do this, you know, I want to tell you how beautiful it is when it rains. I've written a song about rain. And people <laughs> would almost boo him, you know. And he had the last laugh because he found an angle, which was to, to write songs for four-year-olds or three-year-olds. Yeah. And became a multi multi millionaire, you know. And so you cannot knock his uh, his uh, decision. But when we were playing the same clubs and so like that, he was someone that you know was almost a joke. Um, and uh, wow. uh, anyway, but Dan was very good. And uh, one day he came to me. I think it was seventy four. So I was um, I was twenty one, and Danny was twenty. And uh, <clears throat> I had become all my life. I had been absolutely fascinated by who did what on records, you know? Sure. So I, so I was a sort of walking encyclopedia. Um, and Dan just said, why don't you produce my demo that I'm going to do next week? And I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. You know, I've never, I know what a producer does. I'm a big fan of people who produce records, you know? So I, I said, I would love that. And I went to um, this place called Captain Audio, which was a four track little basement studio in Toronto. And, uh, we were gonna just do some, you know, acoustic guitar and vocal demos. And when I got there, the engineer was there and Danny was there and there was another guy there. And it was a small studio. And um, 
The other guy was wearing a white peasant shirt, young my age, but you know, long, long Jesus black hair, uh, beard, mustache. You know, he looked very guru-like at, at age 20. Um, and I'm looking at him, I'm going to myself, who is this, you know? And over the course of like the next little while, I realized he's a friend of Dan's. But then I found out that Danny had made us a creative blind date without telling us. So he had gone to school with this guy named Matt McCauley, whose father was one of the great musical directors of Canada. And Matt had inherited all of that guy's gifts. And at age 20, Matt was an absolute phenomenon. Uh, he, could or he could orchestrate, you know, a 70 piece orchestra at age 20. Um, and uh, Dan decided in his own brilliant little mind that Matt and I would make great partners, but didn't tell either of us that we were going to be there. That's so cool, the first, man. Yeah, first little while, we were like two, you know, roosters, you know, just circling, you know, and then... Um, Trying to figure out who's going to be the well, alpha. Well, it's like, I thought I was producing the demo. Yeah. No, I thought, you know, and so, uh, but then by the end of it, we realized we really liked each other and we really had good ideas. And okay. then we had a dinner and the next thing you know, we were inseparable and became partners. Um, and then we got a, a, a Matt's parents financed Dan's first album, which was then sold to a, a major label. And um, Matt and I became producers. So all of a sudden I backed into uh, being a record producer and having a partner. And Matt's still my closest friend to this day and he still does my strings for me. That's but awesome. He, he left music full time many, many years ago. But uh, uh, up until about, I think, 1981, we were partners, and uh, those are incredible years. He, was, he, he is an amazing person. Yeah. What a good story. When, when, when you were working on that Dan Hill record, so you're 21, did you have any inkling that like this thing was going to blow up or that it was even a good song? Well, um, I have to just make a minor uh, a correction, which is that the first album we did um, was not the one that had some times when we touched on it. Okay. Uh, the first album we did was a hit in Canada. And the single You Make Me Want to Be was a big hit in Canada. Um, and we got released in the U.S., but it, it, we didn't do much there. And then 20th Century Fox released us in, in, uh, uh, in the U.S., but the first two albums didn't do that well. Um, and the third album, called Longer Fuse, during the making of that record, we were told by 20th Century Fox Records out of LA that if we didn't have a hit this time, they would drop us. Right. And that was pretty heavy for, you know, at that point we were 23 or something, you know. And uh, um, Dan had gone to Los Angeles because the pressure was so great that they wanted him to start co-writing with some of the bigger writers. Yeah. And Barry Mann, who had written things like You've Lost That Love and Feeling and uh, Here You Come Again, and, you know, I mean, you name it, Barry's written it, um, Barry and Cynthia. He got a, a chance to write with Barry, and Danny froze and uh, wasn't able to co-write that day. And um, at the end of this unfortunate session, <laughs> Barry said, well, hey, man, do you have any lyrics? And I'll just go home and write music to a lyric. And Dan pulled out of his guitar case a lyric, which is a song he already wrote the music for, but he gave him the lyric anyway. And uh, he had, we had done a demo of the original version of Sometimes We Touch with Dan's music, and it's, it's awful. It's plodding and boring and awful. And Barry went home that night, and I have the actual original uh, cassette tape where Barry sings into a little um, you know, cassette machine playing piano this monstrously hooky song with his music and Dan's lyrics. It sounded like Elton John's Your Song or something. Yeah, like that, you know? yeah, very much. And, and I have, I still have that cassette. And that cassette was sent to us and we all just flipped and we said, oh my God, that's a hit, you know. Then we had a lot of pressure to, to actually record that hit. But actually the first take was the take we took off the floor and, uh, um, Danny had a rough time doing the vocal. That's a whole other story, but um, it was a smash hit around the world. And, and to answer your question, you know, in those days, things really were possible. You know, yeah. it, uh, uh, you really did have chances to, to, to have a hit um, if things were aligned, if things were aligned properly. And um, 
we just felt we had a smash and we did. That's great. Yeah. It's nice to hear that story where you said, Hey, this is your third record. If it, you, you know, they were willing to make an investment of three records in somebody and it's, Oh, in those uh, days. Yeah. 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 It's really amazing how like now you got to do it. On, everything is, you know, DI do it your own, your own, man. Well, yeah. And if you have a major record deal, you know, you have to have, you have a, they put a million dollars behind you and you have to have a hit. Otherwise you're done anyway. Yeah. Wow. Thanks. That was a really cool story. That's, that's the edited version, you know? So there's a lot of story there. Yeah. Um, where, where did you grow? Like you, you grew up in Long Island? I grew up in Merrick, Long Island. Okay. What was your childhood like growing up? It was easy. Um, you know, it was very, uh, leave it to Beaver, sort of uh, suburban, but we were close to New York City, like 40 minutes away but from New York. Sure. So we had that, you know, the epicenter of the world, so close by, but we were still in a suburban place. So it was fairly safe. You know, when I grew my hair long, I did get a lot of beatings from bullies. Um, but uh, when, I left high, when I left high school three months in, um, I never had to face the bullies again. You know? Wow. <laughs> That's one way to get out of it, man. Yeah. Uh, at a certain point in time, um, you, you were split like between LA and Toronto. Uh, I was curious what prompted those moves and then what was your experience like in each place? You know, good, bad, ugly. Well, the t Toronto years, you know, from 72 to, uh, we moved to LA in 78. They were like, we owned that city. It was just the most exciting time. The city was very wide open and we were just young and, and, and we had a lot of power within the, the the music world and uh, in the entertainment world there, it was fun. It was just a wide open place. And then I got, you know, we got um, moved to LA in 78, Matthew and I, to work for Clive Davis. And he moved us to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, that worked out for about six months. And then halfway through the year, um, we fell we fell into a problem with him. And, um, and then I stayed in LA, Matthew stayed in LA, uh, I got married to my girlfriend in uh, Toronto, moved her there, and Matt met someone who was worth about a billion dollars. And uh, that was sort of the end of our, of our partnership because he didn't have to work anymore. Yeah, right. Um, it wound up being his undoing for many years because of other problems. But um, I stayed in LA you know, for the next few years producing some nice projects. And then my wife and I wanted to go back to Toronto because we wanted to raise our kids in a a really normal, safe environment. And um, I, didn't feel, I didn't feel LA was the right choice. Normal or safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we moved back in 81. Um, I had to reinvent myself. And, uh, uh, and then in much later years, I moved back to, to LA for a year, a year and a half to run Disney's, uh, uh, the Disney record label, uh, A&R. Yeah. yeah. And then, I and, and I and I love listen. I love LA. I have sure. I have I, I have great great love for LA and its history, and uh, and I also love Toronto, and I also love Nashville, and you know I have a lot of places I call home. What what you said you had to reinvent yourself. How did you go about doing that? Well, it was painful. We moved back in '81 um, and had our first kid in '84, and I thought when I got back to Toronto, I'd be like you know it'd be a homecoming for me. And instead, it was just it was like, three years. It's just yeah, it was three, like three years, you know. Yeah. And man, it was like I had to start over. And uh, there were some very tough years. In 82, 83 were tough years. I, I, you know, I picked up some work and did some other things, but I thought I'd be like, you know, having the pick of the Canadian litter. Um, but uh, then around 84, uh, uh, well, 82, I had done a score for a fairly well distributed uh distributed feature film where i used matt's father to do the orchestrations and i learned a lot during that time but then around 84 85 i started to get falling into some some work um as a tv and film composer and i had to get my keyboard chops a lot better because i started to have to use um you know samplers and synthesizers and stuff and then I became sort of one of the great um, uh, cheerleaders of the Kurzweil 250 keyboard sampler sequencer. And for many, many years, uh, I was one of their poster boys. And uh, 
you know, I, I, for that, you know, next run, I was, I think from 85 till I left Toronto in 2001, I was probably the busiest film and TV composer out of Canada doing both U S and Canadian work. How did you trend? Like, obviously writing for films is totally different than writing on your own. Cause you have something to write too. Yeah. I like that better. I like that better. Yeah. Talk about that. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think some people can sit around and, um, and look at an empty canvas. Sorry, my nose is itchy. Um, uh, they can look at an empty canvas and love being alone and just pull great ideas out of the air and write them on guitar or piano and write great songs. I wasn't damaged enough to do that. Um, you have to really be someone with a lot of hurt to write those really important songs. Um, I've worked with the great songwriters all my life. And, uh, you know, the one thing they have in common is they have a lot of trauma or sadness and that's how they channel it. You know, I wasn't that person, you know, so I loved producing other artists because I liked the teamwork and I liked being able to, um, you know, to make someone else sound great. And, uh, and I liked being behind the camera, but as far as the comparison of writing songs, which I wasn't doing that much of anymore, and then by the time, you know, 84, 85 rolled around, I became a full-time TV and film composer. I liked being able to go, well, this scene is, you know, he's holding her and she just lost her baby. Well, I'll write a sad piece. You know, I liked having direction. The it, was, it was a lot harder for me when I didn't have direction. And that's a very astute observation about and, and candid uh, to for yourself to realize I, I wasn't i wasn't fucked up enough yeah that's what i'm stuff. saying though but that's a pretty astute i mean because some people don't get that and you know you have to have some pain to to be a good musical uh artist and composer. well i mean to, to be a great singer songwriter or a great songwriter um in the style of a Joni mitchell or a james taylor or neil young or you know you name them um jimmy webb uh christopherson man you gotta have some pain yeah, and, and that that pain comes out in these brilliant songs. Man, that's a very good observation. Um, you had said something there. I wanted to ask you. Sorry. Uh, okay, then. How did you get so good at writing children's songs? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it is tough enough to write something appealing to your peer group, but to write something. I mean that that's a to me, that would seem to be a challenge. Because how do you know what kids are going to like? Well, um, I, you know, I understand your side of it. For me, writing kid songs was like rolling off a log because, again, I I had a direction which was I had to make something simple and and sweet and funny for kids, and um, I found it so much less important, uh, I guess, to be astute lyrically. You know, because I could write something that was just really simple and playful. Yeah. So, so no, I, I actually, I had a really easy time writing. I still do, right? Uh, I do, you know, I did six lullaby albums, instrumental lullaby albums. Uh, only one was original uh, material. The rest were all arrangements. But um, I can write lullabies, you know, like I can write 10 a day. Um, <laughs> in, in, in instrumental ones. Yeah. And I, I, I could write kids songs. I could write 10 a day. That's amazing, man. They, you know, I read something just the other day. It said that you know you are in the right place when the talent that you need to do that comes easier to you than it does mm -hmm. to other people. Sure. So obviously you definitely found your place there. Man. Well, I fell into things, didn't I? Yeah, I fell yeah. into things. And, and uh, I would not have expected to be a record producer, and then I fell into it. And I would never have wanted to be a film and TV composer because I don't like being alone. And that's a lot of lonely hours every day. And I was on deadlines every day. So, I mean, it was, it was challenging. Um, I, the money was great and I was taking care of my family and I was doing something that I felt was, uh, was important musically uh, and creatively. But um, I, I can say that, you know, out of all the things I've ever done, the one thing I would not want to go back to is is a writing TV and film score. Uh, I could do themes and I can do, you know, uh, uh, that kind of stuff. But to actually score stuff, uh, my, my fastball's gone. 
You know? Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. I did it for 16 years. Yeah. You said that you sort of fell into things. What is your take on that in general? I mean, like, is it like spiritually or do you think it's Sarah? You know, no, I'm, I'm curious because I'm, I, I think it seems to me that when you are do, doing something that A, you really like and B, in some way, the universe or God, whatever you want to call it, it's different things for different people, supports that everything sort of works. Right, right. Um, yeah. Keep no, going. I say, what is your take on all that? I, you know, for me, I think um, I just was very open to, to, uh, um, to any opportunities that, um, yeah, I, I, this is probably the least spiritual answer you'll get. Um, it's all right. As long as it's honest, you know, I don't care. <laughs> I, I needed, I needed to make a living. You know, yeah. I, I, I wasn't a trust fund kid. I was on my own. And sure. uh, I think every situation that came my way, I was sort of, I, I, I tried to be able to grab it, you know? And yeah. so I think I had a tremendous drive. Um, but I, I, I want to underline something, which I think is important for your listeners. Um, I was very ambitious, you know, but I didn't have the killer instinct. Um, I didn't give a shit if I was number one or number four. Sure. As long as I was, as long as I was doing well and, and feeling good about the creative process I was doing, uh, I was thrilled and making a living doing it. I was thrilled. Sure. And, and so, um, uh, but I was ambitious because I wanted to keep making a living and I wanted to keep doing better and, and, uh, but I didn't have that drive of like, got to be number one. That, that's not me, you know? Yeah. I think that thing is overrated because like, like, how do you be number one at anything? I mean, there's always a stronger guy than you in the gym. There's always a guy that makes more money yeah. down your, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm it's an empty. It's an empty pursuit for me. Yeah. But I can tell you that the people who have done the best in, in our business and of course in any entertainment business, the ones who you know are like the giants. Yeah. Many of them really have that killer instinct where it's not good enough to be number two. And mm -hmm. I was never that person. Yeah. Well, I think a lot, I think a lot of that, and there's nothing wrong with this, what I'm going to say, mm -hmm. it's not a judgment. I think to, to be like a number one rock star, you have to really be motivated by ego has to drive you. Mm -hmm. very much. And again, I'm, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not that guy either. I don't really give a shit about that. I just want to do my best that I can yeah. do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've noticed it, it and ego, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, those are the people that are concerned with getting a million likes on a Facebook post. You know, they're driven by that, you know, yeah. by, yeah. by other yeah. people liking them. Yeah. And I think you need to have that component to really be that number one. Well, I, I think I think so. I mean, but you know, you look at someone like a Clive Davis, whose you know whose ego is humongous and notoriously <laughs> humongous, and you know he had to be number one all the time. And, yeah. and look at someone again who, who I, I actually I know I know David David Foster is a great example. You know, David had the killer instinct; he had to be number one. Yeah, and um, you know, good for him because it sure. it, it paid off brilliantly. But um, I just wasn't that person. So sure. Um, for me, the, I was ambitious, but the satisfaction of doing good work and working with great people um, and also making a great living out of music were, were, were really, that were, those were my goals. Yeah. yeah, I totally get that, man. And it worked out for you, for sure, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, for, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you about a variety of artists you've worked with. If you could talk about how the gig came about and if there's any cool or interesting stories about working with them. Sure, sure. Let's start with Vince Gill. Well, uh, Vince, who I, uh, people who are his friends call him Vinny. Uh, I call him Vinny. Um, he lives on the other side of the tracks, uh, uh, the better side of the tracks where, where I live. Um, <clears throat> we became friends through Jimmy Webb because they're both uh, Oklahomans and um, they're Okies. And uh, when I was doing the Jimmy Webb album, uh, Just Across the River, which was our first of two duet albums of Jimmy's Greatest Songs, recorded in Nashville. Um, we had a song called Oklahoma Nights, um, which I had originally done the demo of in 81. 
And um, we cut that on this record, whatever, 2010 or something. And, uh, and Jimmy called Vince and said, you know, would you sing on this? And I didn't realize, but like Vinny will sing on anyone's <laughs> record. Uh, he's known as sort of the girl who can't say no um, in the best way, in the best yeah. way, because he's so kind. He's so, and he's so giving of his gift, which is immense. I mean, his guitar playing is off the charts and his musicality and his voice is one of the greatest voices ever in the history of singing. So I met Vince in the studio the first time doing the demo, I'm doing the duet on that album. But then that just became a, a series of other duets that I did with him on other projects, uh, Johnny Mathis and, and uh, oh, oh, a bunch of other things I've done with him. And uh, we just love working together. And I love Amy, his wife, she's a doll. I've done some duets with her. But Vinny is, is uh, very special to me. He's, he's uh, you know, his, his uh, talent, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's genius. I mean, his, his uh, musicality and his, uh, his abilities, uh, his vocals and his guitar playing are, are the stuff of genius. Right on, man. Chris Cornell. Mm. Worked with Chris once on the Rita Wilson album, AMFM, which I think was sometime probably around... I'm thinking it was around 2011, 2012. And Rita is Greek and of Greek heritage and had become friendly with Chris Cornell's wife, who was Greek. And we had different guest stars, and it was a two album set actually of Rita doing uh, uh, songs from the 60s and 70s on AM and songs that were on FM. It was a beautiful record. Um, and so we cut most of that in L.A., almost all of it in L.A. And Chris Cornell came over one day to sing the duet on All I Have to Do is Dream, the Everly Brothers song. Uh, and um, I was in awe of him. I was a great fan of his voice. And uh, uh, he was kind. He was funny, man. I got some great photos. And, you know, we had a great day that day doing the vocal. And, um, you know, uh, I was just honored to, again, to... So many of these people that I, that I work with, I'm honored to have the op opportunity to, to work with them, you know, and he was easy to produce. I mean, obviously, you know, when you produce someone like these people, you know, you don't, you're not telling them what to do, Yeah. but you're helping them, you know, you're just helping them and saying, well, did you, did you like that pass? And, and they'd say, well, you know, I like that one line. What do you think? I say, I love the other line, you know, whatever you, you work together, but I'm not like directing, you know these people, uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm working with them, collaborating. Sure. And uh, Chris was lovely, and his death was terribly sad, and uh, you never know what goes on behind someone's brain. Yeah, man, that's for sure. Uh, another giant, Chris Christofferson. Mm, yeah. <laughs> that was a great uh, experience. Um, while I was in my TV and film years in Toronto, I dabbled because I wanted to get back into making records. And I did an album for a uh, um, Guardian EMI called 10 Easy Pieces with Jimmy Webb. And um, that was an important record in my career um, in 96. And then that begat a, what was going to be a songwriter series on C which was the great songwriters doing their own stuff uh, unplugged basically. Oh, cool. And, and Chris, uh, Barry Mann, uh, Barry Mann, we did an album called Soul and Inspiration. And the Soul and Inspiration album included a duet with him and Carole King on You've Lost That Love and Feeling. And again, wow. very unplugged, beautiful record. Um, and his version of On Broadway, um, again, just unplugged, gorgeous, t timeless. And um, then the next one was Christopherson. And my A&R person at, at uh, EMI, in New York, Jay Landers, who was very much behind these records, um, said, what do you think of Chris? And I, I said, well, you know, I know he's a great writer. I said, I've never liked his voice. I've never liked the albums he's made. And, and I listened to some of the albums, you know, the early albums, which had his hits on them, uh, were terrible records. I mean, they were Nashville uh, at their worst in those days, you know, just like those Three, three background chick singers, white singers, um, and Chris trying to sing and trying to croon, and he's not a crooner, you know, he's no. like a villain, you know? Yeah. And so those albums are unlistenable, but they have all, their, all the hits on them. So I remember reading 
again, because here I am, this musical encyclopedia, I remember that Chris had been um, so uh, enamored of Bob Dylan that he um, found a way to work as a janitor while Dylan was recording Blonde on Blonde in, Nash in Nashville. Holy shit, I didn't know that. You didn't know that, yeah. No. He actually, he was getting, uh, from Combine Music and Monument, he was getting paid to be a writer, but he actually had the balls to go to CBS Studios and say, could I be a janitor? And he was a janitor, and he was a fly on the wall for all those Blonde on Blonde sessions. And I knew how much that sound of those records meant to him. And I knew that that's the record sound he always wanted but didn't get. And so I suggested that we bring, we had to meet in Austin because um, Chris was making a movie near Austin. And this was 97. And we had, and I was still, still doing my TV and film score and living in Toronto, but we all met in Austin. I brought two players from Nashville, Larry Paxton um, on bass and John Willis on guitar. I had and John I, Willis on my show here. Nice guy, man. Oh, John's the greatest. He Lovely was, guy, man. Yeah, real, real nice guy. Great person. Um, great player. Um, and then I brought uh, from um, L.A. Mike Baird and Jim Cox. Piano on Jim and, and Mike Baird on drums. And we all met in Austin. I met Chris the night before we started the album. That was the first time I met him. And he was like, if you produce Jimmy Webb, you're good enough for me. And I said, well, I'm going to make a great record with you. Here are the songs we're going to do. And I told him, I said, we're going to do them like live in the studio with a really great band, but in a Dylan vibe of Blonde on Blonde. And he was just smiled from ear to ear. And he said, oh, that's what I've always wanted, you know. And we cut this record called The Austin Sessions. And um, it did very well, I mean, with, with no publicity. But uh, it wound up being on Atlantic, and it did very well. It's come out again as a... Uh, expanded edition you can get on Amazon. Um, but I must say it was more fun than Barrel Monkeys, man. It was just so much fun to be in Austin and, and making that record. And uh, Chris was marvelous and the players were perfect. And we made a record that he considers, Chris has told me numerous times that, that that's his gravestone. Oh, that is awesome, man. The Austin Sessions album is his gravestone. Now, didn't he do a record with Dylan, the... Uh billy the kid or something like that chris and dylan well chris i think was in the movie wasn't he with with uh, dylan the pat garrett and billy the kid pat garrett and billy the kid it's a great soundtrack man yeah yeah i don't know if he ever combined with dylan i know that they i know that uh knocking on heaven's door was the big dylan hit from that but uh, sure i never saw the movie so i don't know you know yeah, but yeah soundtrack. but making the album with chris there's great stories because you know he really was such a big star and women fell at his feet Really? I mean, even at age, whatever he was, he was probably 70 at that point, or 69 or, or something. And, and he looked incredible, and women would fall at his feet. They were, yeah. I, mean, I mean, literally. I mean, we would go to restaurants after our session, and there would be women, and they would get up out of their chairs, and they'd circle the restaurant, <laughs> just walking slowly, looking at him. That and I said to Chris, and I said to him, I said, <laughs> Does this happen all the time? He goes, Fred, it happens all the time. <laughs> Poor guy. And it's uh, pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. What's he, you know, his um, TV, his character persona in movies is a little intimidating. When you first meet him, do you have that in the back of your mind or is he just like so ingratiating that it's like, oh man, it's cool, dude? You know, you know, it, it, I think anytime you meet someone who is a legend, yeah, it is intimidating, but I didn't have an intimidation uh, about anything he had been. Uh, I didn't know most of what he had done on film and TV. Okay, so, so I, I just, uh, you know, I just wanted to make a good impression that night at the hotel before we went in the next day, and he was just kind, and he was, you know, he was lovely. Yeah, his TV, his uh, film characters are uh, like a eat like Clint Eastwood in you know the 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 Dirty Harry movies or the Western, you know, just a little bit intimidating. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, another legend, man, Mark Knopfler. Yeah. What'd you do with Mark? Mark? Um, yeah, Mark is uh, again. He he is the greatest and uh, truly one of my inspirations as a guitar player. When I when I play without a pick, I'm constantly saying, 
what would Mark do? And of course, I don't come anywhere close to what. Oh God, who who but does? Who is, can? Well, I was saying, but he is a tremendous inspiration to me, both as a writer and, and singer, as and guitar player, and actually TV and film composer. He's written some gorgeous stories. Yeah. Um, and I trying to remember how I got to know Mark, but um, I think I just reached out to him cold um, to uh, to do something. I guess it was the Christopherson album. I asked him to, to, to sing a duet with Chris on Please Don't Let the Story End and to play a guitar solo. And uh, he did it uh, in England and sent it to me and we put it on the album. And since then we've become great pals. And whenever he comes into town, I try to see him. Um, he doesn't get here often anymore, but um, we've become friends, we're pen pals. And uh, he's done about five or six uh, uh, duets or guitar parts for me on different records and I'm just honored to know him yeah man what an amazing talent he is yeah. just incredible lovely man and honored to know him uh, a guy I had here on this show one of the coolest dudes so high energy and so talented Jim Peterick what'd you do with Jim oh I love Jim yeah he's so, awesome that guy man yeah I mean listen there's a great album Hold on. I can actually let me just do this right here. Um, if you can see this album. Yeah, yeah, what is it? It's Jim called Peterick. Peterick the Songs. Yeah, yeah. You should go get it if you don't have it. It's um, an album we did about six, seven years ago, six years ago, of Jim doing his most famous songs, Unplugged. Oh, that's and cool. That's oh, cool. and it's really lovely. I mean, we did like uh, Eye of the Tiger with me playing banjo and Jim on acoustic guitar and a fiddle, and it was uh, it was lovely. Like just, we really reinvented the songs and one of my favorite projects. And Jim is one of my favorite people. Just, you know, again, wildly, wildly gifted, but also yeah. incredibly uh, uh, driven and ambitious and um, never stops writing good songs. Really, yeah. you know, he's amazing because with him, it's a little more craft, you know, because um, he's not writing a lot of, uh, uh, these days, he doesn't write a lot of stuff that, you know, that's all about his heartbreak or something. But he has the ability to write songs, and most artists of his age who have written so much are all written out by now, and he's yeah. not. Well, one thing that helps him that he said is, you know, he, he's meticulous with his notebooks. Oh, my God. He showed me his room of notebooks. It's all yeah. one room. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so he's smart enough that when he gets a good idea, he immediately puts it down, and then it could channel it into something else when it's appropriate. He's yeah. really organized with that. Yeah, he, he's incredibly organized, and, and uh, he, he would be a great uh, mentor for anyone. You know? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Did he, he, I'm sure he told you the story of, of uh, how he came up with Vehicle. Yes, sure. That was pretty cool. It's just Fantastic. everything about that dude was cool. Man, I remember listening to that record when I was 16 years old. In Great Long Island, record. Man. Long Island going, God, this is the hottest single ever, man. It's like, I, you know, when it was on the radio, I'd crank it up in the car and, you know, and just, I just said, man, this is, I know it's supposed to be like blood, sweat and tears, but it's better. It's better, you know. Great stuff, man. And I thought it was one of the most powerful things on radio. You know? And it is, it's 60 yeah. years later, it's still popular. It, it really is. I mean, if you put that thing on and crank it, it's awesome. It's you know? great, man. The opening yeah. of that with the horns, it's yeah. awesome. Oh, it's fantastic. And then one more, Jackson Brown. Jackson's lovely. I mean, I, I, got, I got to work with him um, again through Jimmy Webb. Uh, uh, we did P.F. Sloan, one of Jimmy's great songs, where Jackson was one of Jackson's favorite songs. So uh, I met Jackson at Village Recorders in LA and we did our vocal overdub duet with him and really enjoyed working with him. And then a, a year later, I worked with him on Rita, uh, uh, Rita Wilson's album. Sure. He sang on one song and, uh, you know, I don't stay in touch with him, but, uh, you know, certainly when I run into him, he's very kind to me and, and uh, he's, you know, he's one of the greatest. Yeah, great songwriter, man. His early records were just really powerful. He's, he's amazing. And, and again, I, you know, I think the hardest thing for me uh, is sometimes, like you say, I, you know, the intimidation that I have is, oh, my God, you know, I mean, you know, these were my inspirations. Um, but I just try to, you know, calm myself down and say, hey, you know, I'm making a living, too. So it's OK. We'll, we'll, we'll work together. But, you know, it is, you know, like a great example of, of how sometimes 
like I'll work really closely with people. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter who they are, whether it's Mark Knopfler, whether it's, you know, uh, but a great example of the opposite, you know, is Willie Nelson. And Willie, you know, of course, uh, a total legend. Um, I'm devoted to him on so many levels. And uh, he knows Jimmy Webb and, and Jimmy, we had a song called, uh, If You See Me Getting Smaller. And there's a line in the song, uh, Willie, you're my constant companion. And it wasn't about Willie Nelson. It was about Willie Williams, uh, Jimmy's old cohort. But Jimmy said, well, Freddie, wouldn't that be great to get, you know, Willie Nelson to sing those lines, you know? And I'm like, that's, I'm trying to imitate Jimmy, his uh, Oklahoma drawl. And, uh, and I'm like, well, that would be awesome. And uh, he just said, well, let me call him, you know, and he called him. And Willie said, well, I'm going to be passing through Nashville in my bus you know, a week and a half from now, he said, if you can, if your producer can meet me in the studio at three o'clock on Wednesday, um, you know, I'll, I'll learn the parts and I'll, I'll be ready, you know? And, you know, literally like a Cheech and, a Cheech and Chong movie, <laughs> the bus pulls up. I, my daughter was visiting with me and my daughter at that point was probably whatever, you know, in her late twenties. Um, the bus pulls up, you know, and I'm standing outside the side door of the studio in, on Music Row. And, you know, I knock on the door and the door opens and smoke did come out. Giant of puff door. of weed cloud, right? I mean, <laughs> weed. Oh, hold on, hold on. All right. I have to kill that. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, I knock on the door, the door, open, door opens and there was a weed cloud that came out, which was wild. And so- um, Like a Cheech and Chong movie, it was like funny. Movie. And, and so um, Willie walks out with his wife and I introduce myself and he goes, oh, Fred, nice to meet you. And the first thing he says to me is, where's the mic? Where's the mic? And I was like, it's right in here, come on in here. Put him in the, in the little booth. My engineer is ready to go. Well, he said, listen, he said, I know exactly what I'm supposed to sing. Let's roll tape. So he, you know, he did three different passes of one verse, which is, and two lines of harmony. And 12 minutes later, we had three passes. And Willie said, what do you think? And I said, I think they're amazing, you know? And he goes, okay, got to go. Gone. 15 minutes. <laughs> all, all he said, and he said, you know, he did autograph an album for me that I could hang in my studio, but... Um, and he, Where is the mic? And, and he took a photo of, of us with, with my daughter and I. Um, but literally, where's the mic? Sang the lines, left 15 minutes later, and um, in a puff of smoke, you know. And, um, <laughs> and, and it's actually one of the most tender moments on that duet album. Uh, that one, I think, is on, uh, if you see me getting smaller, is also, I think it's on Just Across the River album. Um, but you can find it on YouTube. Just go Jim, Jimmy Webb, Willie Nelson. Um, that is so cool, man. But yeah, it was so funny. It was like, you know, where's the mic? And, you know, it's like, where's the mic? It was this very, you know, Willie Nelson. Where's the mic? You know? And, and it, it, is it good? And I said, it was great. I got, got to go. <laughs> Gone. Man, you know what? You, because of that, the puff of smoke thing, you wouldn't think he'd be so prepared. Or any human, not him, anybody. That's like, yeah. you know, yeah. but that just shows you, man, that, and that's why he's been so successful. He doesn't fuck around when it comes to no. I mean, he's, he's a one take guy. He just you know he rehearses at home and, and then doesn't want to spend any longer than even on his own albums. I mean, he just he literally just one pass each. Next, 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 next. You know. So. Wow, that's so cool. Anybody yeah. else you want to talk about where you had like a fun or cool experience that comes? Oh my to god! Mind? You know, in a lifetime of fun and cool. I was gonna say we we could go for forty hours. You know, I mean, I I am writing a book, by the way. I I I've, uh, I've, I'm probably sixty percent through. Um, right on, man. That's very cool. I, I I don't I don't want to mention the publisher, but it is a music book publisher. And, it's great, uh, man. And it, and the stories are great. The stories. We'll are come great. back on the show when the book comes out. Oh my god! Absolutely. But yeah, I'm man. Really, I'm really proud of. I'm proud of, of, of the, of my accomplishments, but I'm also so grateful to have had um, such incredible musical experiences with people. When, um, when you went, moved back to LA to work for Disney, was that a tough adjustment to suddenly be an employee? 2000, 2000, 
Uh, you know, it was a it was an interesting opportunity. My my dear friend Jay Landers had left his position there as head of A and R for Walt Disney Records, but I had done a lot of projects for them, so they knew me, and um, I was in line to be looked at and. I auditioned basically, they had interviews, and I got in. And, you know, there was a real allure there because first of all, I liked the fact that it was a kid's music label of that power um, because then I didn't have to worry about hits, you know, and, and like, I, I don't know if I wanted to be an A&R person in 2007, 2008, uh, you know, trying to make pop hits. Yeah. That been, the pressure would have been crazy. But making kids albums, there was no pressure. Yeah, um, but there was pressure, and and you're and what you're asking really is, um, I made the leap October two thousand seven, and I left at the end of two thousand eight. Um, so that little, little over a year of being in the corporate world was really rough for me. Yeah, I got to um, believe that when you're self-employed for so long. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Anybody... I, I, I I know that it was a. Um, yeah. It was a hard adjustment. I liked the stability of it. I liked the paycheck. I sure. liked the stable totally. paycheck. I also liked the fact that I could keep making records within the gig. Like I was constantly in the studio. Right. But but the actual, you know, Disney is not known to be uh this, you know, wonderful place to work. I mean, it's yeah. it's a it's a big corporation and 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 uh I was overwhelmed at times, absolutely, and uh I did really, I had a tremendously successful time there. Actually, one, one of their biggest years was, was one of the years I was there. Um, some things because of what I did and a lot of things that were already in play. Sure. Uh, but we, we just kicked ass. But after a year and a half, I was, I was done. Yeah, I got, I, I got to believe that was, I mean, I've been working for myself 21 years to, I, I don't really feel I'm employable even, to be honest. It's, it, <laughs> no, I mean, because I don't like being told what to do. I don't have a thing about telling others what to do. I'm not like, but I yeah. just like, it's, that's yeah. got to be tough, man. It, it, it was, I mean, there were times that, were, that yeah. it, you know, it really was, but there was also a lot of good that came out of it. And I'm not sorry I did it. Um, oh, yeah. And I'm, not, and I'm not sorry I left. You know, so. Right on, man. Uh, you worked on the VH1 movie Daydream Believers, which is the monkey story. And in addition to composing, long time ago. Yeah, yeah. In addition to uh, composing the underscore, you were also the MD. How did that project come about? How did you get involved? And what did you like most about this experience? Well, first of all, we're talking 1999, I think. Your recall um, of dates is like I'm really <laughs> impressed, man. Their your memory is like. Well, you know what? You know what it is. I also remember things around those dates. So uh, 1999, I was living in Toronto still still very busy as a film and TV composer. Um, and um, I had done some work for, for one of the producers uh, on that project and they wanted me for this project. And when I was told what it was, I was like, oh shit, this is gonna be fun because I love the monkeys. And yeah. again, I'm an encyclopedia of this stuff. And uh, I was, you know, I was given the four guys and I, I basically had to teach guys to fake guys who faked. <laughs> uh, and so we rehearsed in a small rehearsal studio and I, you know, some guys had never played an instrument before and I just worked with them until I got them looking so convincing that even some of the monkeys had told me that they, they were so impressed with, with and I, you know, having me on set on location, um, I was able to really, you know, make sure that, you know, the guys were really not out of sync and they were in, playing the right thing and you know so actually if you look at that movie which is on tv and available on, on streaming um i think you're going to see that that the musical sequences are really well done i mean and i i i was hired to mentor them i was hired to oversee the the shooting of them um so i was i was actually the musical director of the shooting um uh which was really a great treat for me and i made sure that it looked great and uh, the kids were great. People I worked with, Neil Fernley, the director, was lovely. And everyone I worked with were fantastic. And uh, it was a lovely film to do. You know, it wasn't very deep, but it was sweet. And uh, I didn't do much score for it. Whatever score I did was fun. And, uh, uh, but I'm most proud of the musical sequences where you see the monkeys play 
Yeah. And these guys did a very, very, they worked hard for me, you know, to make it look real. That's cool. Did you, you said you had some contact with the original monkeys? Yeah. I mean, I heard, I heard from Peter Tork years later. Um, uh, he came to my house one time when we had a, a Sunday night dinner and, um, and then uh, I heard through uh, Harold Bronson at Rhino that Mickey Dolenz had said that um, he thought that the casting was terrific and that the musical sequences looked really good. Oh, that's cool, man. That's nice to get that feedback. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, Mike, at that point, Mike Nesmith was not really uh, involved, didn't want to be involved in anything monkeys. And, uh, and Davy Jones, I had no connection with. But. Sure. Uh, Fred, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Well, that's a long, probably long ass answer. Um, <laughs> you live long enough. It's gotta be, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think the dark periods, um, hmm, you know, I, I, I think one of them was definitely after having um, this big hit with sometimes when we touch and then not really being able to follow it up with Dan and then uh, being in LA and not really doing the kind of work I was hoping I'd be getting and then wanting to go back to Toronto. I think those first few years in Toronto, maybe 81, 82, 83, were where I was really surprised that I was pretty well, you know, having a hard time getting employed. Sure. And, uh, and after a great run, and I was still pretty young, and I was going, wait a second, you know, am I done? You know? Yeah. So I, I would think that, you know, that's my wife had to go back to work, and uh, I remember... I remember that really being rough, and I remember having my first child, uh, Aaron, who uh, um, was born in 84. I remember holding him up, you know, I remember crying, so because I wanted so much to be the kind of a parent who could take good care financially of, of my children. And then literally within the next six or seven months, things changed drastically, and I was writing TV score, and my whole career had changed, and... Um, I start. I didn't. I never looked back. But those three years, those were rough years. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um. Any advice, if you can go back, assuming you would listen, any advice you would have given to yourself that would have made <laughs> would have made life easier, professionally, personally, any way you want. <laughs> I'll tell you the one story that that I wish I had a do over. You know. Um. We were in L.A. under the auspices of Clive Davis. And uh, Matt and I were living at the Chateau Marmont. It was a wild time. It was fantastic. That's, that's pretty cool. 1978, you know, we had just come off of Dan's big hit. And uh, we were producing some cool stuff for Clive. And now I was producing the first Jimmy Webb album we produced. It was just, and then I got married. It was an incredible time. And, um, and you know, we were going to be living at the Chateau Marmont for a year, but six months into it, I got a phone call in the morning because New York's three hours different. And uh, it's Clive Davis on the phone. And I, you know, it was probably a little groggy. And I answered the phone. And don't forget at this point, I'm really still, even though I've been doing this since I was 16, you know, at age, whatever it was, 23 or something. Uh, You're you know, a baby, I was, man. I mean, I, I was still, yeah. I mean, I, I still didn't know shit. You yeah. Know? I knew how to make a record uh, compared to other people um, my age and stuff, but there were still things I had to learn about life and, uh, and also about dynamics. And this is a really important lesson. Clive is notoriously the most egomaniacal character. Um, he loved Matthew and I and thought we were geniuses and moved us to LA. Six months in, we were in the middle of an album for Randy Edelman and Randy was a, uh, um, one of these characters who was a great writer and had never had success as a singer-songwriter. But Clive loved his writing and had signed him, and we were producing his album. Randy was a very sweet guy, very sensitive. He became a great film and TV composer. Um, but um, so during the autumn of 78, uh, you know, we had been in L.A. for like, whatever, four or five months by now. Then we start this Randy Edelman album, and we're in the middle of it, I get that call at the hotel and it's Clive and I, you know, I answered the phone and Clive said, Hey, I want you to stop Randy's album 
Um, I have a song that I think is perfect from Melissa Manchester, and I think it's going to be a smash hit. And I want you guys to produce it. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. I said, um, you know, and he goes, yeah. He said, it's, uh, it's going to be a smash. And uh, he, sa he said, so just, you know, just stop work on Randy. And I said, okay. I said, um, this is because I'm a caring person. I said, and Randy, sensitive artist. Um, I said, so um, are we just sort of temporarily, you know, what do I tell Randy? Yeah, what do you tell Randy? It's well, a logical I, I, I said, question. I said, what do I tell Randy? I said, are we, are we sort of just, t are we telling him that we have to take some other gig temporarily? So, but we'll, we'll be right back kind of thing. And there's a long pause. And he said, you don't get it. And he hung up. Wow. And he called Harry Maslin, who became a friend in later years another producer and gave Harry don't cry out loud, which was a big hit for Melissa Manchester. And I, I fucked up because what I should have said was whatever you say, whatever you yeah, say. But how the hell are you supposed to know that? I mean, that's a normal question. Well, I know it now. I listen, when I, when I work with some people who are very, you know, who are big shots and sometimes they'll say something and you don't say, let's talk about it. You say whatever you want. You know, and I should have said to Clive, I made a mistake. I didn't know. I should have said to him, whatever you want, you know? Yeah, but that and, still had the open. And I, and, I could, and I could have found a way to tell Randy he would have been upset, but I made a mistake because it, it would have changed my career. And, uh, and it, would have, uh, it would have been a great success for us. And uh, um, uh, three months later, Clive ended our relationship. Uh, three weeks later, rather, he ended our relationship. And, and, uh, uh, that was a, it was a, it was my fault because I didn't understand that when someone like Clive Davis tells you to do something, you do it. Yeah. But I, I understand what you're saying, but like, I think it's a really reasonable thing as a 23 year old person to say, Hey man, no problem. What do we just, what do I tell yeah. this guy? Yeah. yeah. Because he's paying everybody. So you'd think right. he would have the, I mean, that's like, you know, it, it was, but that's Clive yeah. at his, at his most uh, uh, cutthroat, you know? And, but, but wow. I, just, but I did, you know, I really, ha if I had it to do again, of course I would have said, Hey man, uh, um, you know, you're paying us whatever you want to do. You know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. But I think, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but I don't, man. I as a human being, I felt good. And as a, as a professional, I felt like a fool. <laughs> Not a 23, man. I would, yeah, that sounds like really forgivable for yourself. I mean, that. Oh, like, oh, I've forgiven myself, but yeah. I regret it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I wish I, I wish I knew more about the business and how to, and how you don't say no to the, you know, when you're dealing with the imperious ones, you know, the ones who are really the kings uh, or the queens, you know, you just have to, you know, you're, you're either don't take the gig or you just say, if that's what you want, that's what you get. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a that's a really that's one of the most interesting stories I've heard in seven hundred interviews. Yeah, man. it was a painful. That, yeah, that's really uh, heavy, man. To be honest with you, it's kind it, was, of, it was a painful one. Yeah, and I I did get to to uh, to spend time with Clive in later years, and uh, he has no memory of that, which is great. I was going to say, did he apologize jokingly because <laughs> it didn't sound no, like? No, I never brought it up, and and uh, uh, no, no. Wow, that is amazing, man. Really interesting. Yeah. Uh, tell, tell me, uh, this is maybe, if this is an unfair question, let me know, because uh, I know you've worked with so many. If you had to pick like top three or four favorite people you've worked with. Well, I mean, I'm devoted to Jimmy Webb. I've worked with Jimmy since I was uh, uh, 22 and uh, I'm still working with him to this day. And so he, he is someone that I musically uh, am again uh, beyond he's beyond that inspiration always has been to me. So for me to collaborate with him and co-conspire with him for all these years, uh, Jimmy would be number one on my list because um, I consider him to be the world's greatest songwriter. Great songwriter. Um, and I think that, uh, I think other people who I love, I mean, there's so many people that I love working with and I loved working with. Um, Johnny Mathis, again, you know, um, he's 84 now, I think, or something. Uh, um, and uh, uh, he still sings in the same keys, and he's amazing. That's and, amazing. Uh, he's kind, and he's loving, and he's supportive. 
and he's the opposite of, of anything you'd ever think a performer would be. He's just, he just, he loves to sing, he loves to play golf, and he loves to cook, and that's his life, you know? So I love him. There's other, uh, there's so many other artists. It's probably an unfair thing because I have so many people I truly adore. And the people that I work with long term, um, you know, I'm always working on something with Michael McDonald as a, you know, in a duet situation. Um, uh, we've never worked together on a full album, but we'd like to. Um, Michael's and, and Amy Holland, his wife, I've produced. Um, they're dear to me. I mean, they're the greatest people. And Michael's one of the greatest uh, singers that, you know, I've ever heard. Um, and uh, kind and funny. And, and I have so many, so many of these people are such truly great friends to me. And, and uh, it would be a really hard thing to, to, to answer. I could probably name you two or three assholes out of literally yeah. uh, 600 people that I've worked with, you know, yeah. only three maybe. Sure. I wouldn't name, I wouldn't name them, but I'm but like literally, I've been so, so uh, blessed by, you know, being able to work with the great musicians, great artists, great singers. And um, I've really, you know, only had a couple of truly bad experiences and they were like two or three. Yeah. No, I, uh, I hear them. you. Cause I've had about the, my numbers are about the same two or three. Yeah. I would never name anybody, but like the amount of uh, kindness in the, in the music business is really pretty high, man. Overall, it's like yeah. off the charts. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just amazed at how, you know, how few times uh, I've had run-ins with people who I, you know, hated or just, you know, we just didn't click or whatever. Sure. Sure. Tell me your uh, top three desert Island discs personally. <laughs> Just for right now, just for this minute. I don't, oh God, I don't have any. Um, I, you know, that's a terrible question. Although, um, I think, I think that some of my favorite records, um, Born to Run, right up there. It's one of the greatest records in the history of recording. Um, Walking in the Rain by the Ronettes, written by Barry Mann and Cynthia and Phil Spector. Um, that record was monumental to me as a kid. Um, Wuthering Heights by Kate Bush, I thought was a piece of genius. Um, uh, Walking in Memphis by Mark Cohn is one of the greatest songs and records I've ever heard. Um, and uh, boy, I have so many, I just couldn't give you more than that. You know? yeah. I have so many inspirations, you know, so. Sure. Uh, most important things you've learned about yourself. Hmm. Well, during this COVID-19 shit, uh, <laughs> is how truly awful it is for me to be alone with myself, because I don't like myself all that much. You know, so. <laughs> Why not? Uh, you know, I just, uh, I have, I'm a Jewish neurotic from Long Island, and I have lots of things that, uh, that probably uh, uh, make me feel, you know, <laughs> worried or this or that or, and, and, uh, so, you know, what I've learned about myself, though, I, I, I mean, that was sort of, I'm just being, I'm being semi-serious because sure. it's hard It's hard to be alone yeah. right now. My kids are not here, and uh, the person, actually, that I'm in a relationship with is in L.A. Um, oh, that's so, tough, man. Um, I, think, I think what I've learned about myself, though, really, is um, that I've had this wonderful life in music, and that's all I ever aspired to was to have a life in music. Man, so you lived your dreams. That's pretty damn good. I, I lived my, my uh, yeah, I mean, it was certainly my dream, and, and it became a way for me to actually make a great living and, and to do important work uh, that I think cheers people up or moves people, and um, I'm just really fortunate to have lived these lives. Who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Wow. Um, I don't know if I can answer what one person. I think I have too many. Um, I think that uh, Ernie Kovacs, <laughs> if you're familiar with Ernie Kovacs, who was the pioneer of visual television comedy in the 50s, was a genius and a workaholic. And um, I call him the patron saint of workaholics. He died in a stupid car accident in 63 or 64. Um, and 
I looked to him as sort of my, a patron saint of mine, you know, because um, his creativity, his love for life and people, and, uh, uh, um, you know, just his, just drive to do everything he possibly could um, and to do it with such uniqueness. I mean, he was, uh, I just looked up to him and, and was only 11 when he died, but I remember crying because I remember loving his shows as a kid. Wow. Yeah. That happens. You know, it's funny when um, my oldest son is 29 and when um, I'm such a brain fart. When uh, Nina Simone passed away, mm. he came to me and he was crying because we used to listen to her as a kid. When he was little, growing up, we'd always listen to her together. So I, I, I wow. understand that. Yeah, and it was really... Yeah, I, I mean, there, there was something very, very important about him. Um, there are many people who are devoted to him. And, uh, and even though um, he was not a musical person, uh, uh, he loved music and used it brilliantly in his uh, uh, visuals that he would do on TV. And, um, but I just, I, I don't know, I just felt such an affinity towards him um, that, that maybe he was the person that, that uh, ha has been my greatest in, sort of inspiration. And, and uh, I guess that's about all I can say. It's that's odd cool. You know? No, no, it, you know, you know, it's whoever inspires you, it inspires you, man. You know, it's, there's no, it's like, who do you pick as a spouse or a partner or a girlfriend or, you know, a yeah. partner, you know whatever that I connection mean, is, you can't define yeah, I'll that. Show you, I'll show you here. The, this is, this is, is that Ernie Kovacs? 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 Yeah, this is Ernie Kovacs. He uh, was notorious for smoking the finest Cuban cigars all day long and all night long. And his, his gravestone, which I went to in L.A., says, Ernie Kovacs, nothing in moderation. And, uh -huh. then, and then says, we all loved him. And this is a check he wrote for cigars. A check he wrote for cigars. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. I love cigars. Yeah. So there you go. So that's my Ernie Kovacs. I mean, it's right here in my kitchen office to remind me um, that he is sort of my patron saint, you know? Fred, do you have any hobbies or interests outside you know, I, of you? I, I certainly did. Um, I don't really anymore. Um, uh, I don't feel the, the same way I did, but I was a collector of autographs and um, movie posters and uh, old baseball cards and things like that, you know, nostalgic kind of things. Um, and those were my hobbies to be a collector. Um, but I sort of stopped doing that a while ago. But um, I have a nice, I've amassed a nice collection. Yeah. Three more questions, man. Uh, toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Wow. Toughest decision I had to make. Well, I mean, those are personal uh, questions. Um, I probably don't think I can answer that. Fair enough. Yeah. Best advice you've ever been given? I think the best advice I've ever been given really comes from my mother, which is, you know, um, you know, that someone asked her uh, a number of years ago when she was in her 90s, you know, what's her secret to longevity? And she said, you have to be up for the challenge. <laughs> that's a pretty cool answer. And I, and I think I think that's a great, great uh, line, you know, and uh, I have a video of my mother only about two years ago. Um, where she was, you know, asked, you know, what's the secret of life? And she said, my mother was a character. Uh, she said, um, she said, don't hang around with downers. Now, of course, it's funny that she would use the word downer, which is a very 60s yeah. you know, hippie word. But my mother lived a long time, so she heard all those kind of words. So she goes, don't hang around with downers. Their negativity will just bring you down. Bring only to hang around with people who are up and happy people. That's and great advice. Said, and she said, don't hang around with stupid people because you need to be around smart people so you can learn and be around people who know more. And I was like, pretty well simple, you know, yeah. and, and pretty well dead on. Um, and so those, those were uh, my mother's words to live by. You, know? you have to be up for the challenge. I like yeah, that one. It's true. It's oh, so it true. true. It is, especially not even for a second. Especially right now. Yeah, man. Going on. 
Yeah. Uh, last question, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Oh my God. I don't know. Um, I think the, these are great questions. Uh, the Thanks. big, <laughs> the, the, uh, the biggest change in my personality, I think certainly I'm not as uh, excitable or wild, um, um, I think, you know, I had a lot more energy. Um, so probably I'm, I'm calm comparatively. Um, although I wasn't not calm, but I was, you know, I, I was, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of energy. I was known more for having, you know, sort of a, a bigger than life, you know, life and personality. And I feel a little more, you know, a, I'm more of a homebody now. So I think my personality has changed in the sense that I probably don't, have the interest in going out as much uh, to see shows or, or you know, that kind of stuff. I, I was already, you know, like not going to many shows because um, uh, I was sort of t tired of them um, and didn't like the crowds and stuff. So probably those things are my, the, the biggest changes, but I still love, you know, going out for dinners and I still love having dinners with friends and I still love being able to go and, and, and be free and not be in a lockdown. Um, but I think the biggest change, yeah, I think over the years is these past 10 years, I've become a lot more of a homebody, um, and, um, and, and not by any means, um, not a homebody where, you know, I like being by myself and not going out, but a homebody meaning like literally I'd rather, after working in the studio, I'd rather cook a dinner. Sure. As, no, I totally as, get it. As, as opposed to go out for dinner. Yeah, you know, I totally get after, it. You know, those kind of things, I've noticed I've been moving towards that direction of, you know, of just liking the ability to to not have to go out all the time. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. cool, man. Hey, talk about your record company, Melody Place, or your oh, record sure. label, I should say. Yes, record label um, distributed by BMG. We have our first album came out at the end of January. It's called uh, The Triangle by Lisa Mills. She's a unbelievable soulful singer from um uh mobile alabama lives in germany now and we did a musical road trip to muscle shoals jackson mississippi and memphis cutting songs in historic studios with historic musicians uh and cutting the songs that were originally cut there and it was such fun and it was such a great experience and lisa kills these songs and the musicians kill these songs and i am so proud of it i really sincerely hope people go stream it go listen to it lisa mills the triangle um and uh and if you have any um interest in it you know, you know cd vinyl it's there and also uh you know get your local americana radio station to play it because it's beautiful uh soulful uplifting uh covers of the great soul music of the 60s and 70s have you uh, learned what not to do uh, to your artists by uh, watching, working with Clive <laughs> Davis? Because <laughs> sometimes people teach you lessons and what not to do, and it's just as oh, important as, as... Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, yeah. I've, been, I've been taught a lot of lessons of what not to do. Yeah, man, for um, sure. For the first one is don't spend your royalty money until you get it. I found yeah, right. The check's not in the mail. It's in the yeah, bank. No, right, man. We, we lost out really big initially on some times when we touched because um, the label in Canada went bankrupt. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. 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 So, oh. so, so my first hard lesson was, you know, don't spend your money uh, until it's in the bank. Um, and, um, great lesson. Yeah. I mean, listen, no, I, I I'm, you know, I'm just, uh, uh, th there's, there's a lot of lessons of what not to do. Uh, and, oh yeah. And, uh, and as far as, you know, I'm known, you know, and, and you have to remember, since 2001, I turned my back on a scoring television and film for like actual score, because um, I was burnt to a crisp, um, and um, went full time back into making records with live musicians and, and producing my artists. And um, you know, I'm known as an artist's producer. I'm known as someone who is there for the artist. I'm making their project. I'm facilitating their vision. And if they don't have one, I'm helping them find it. And um, I, you know, there are people who are producers who are bullies. And you, you, 
sign with them to make a record uh, so that you'll get their sound or you'll get, you know, or you'll be told what to do or something. You know, I'm not that person. I'm right. analogous to what they call an actor's director in film and TV. You know, uh, you know, there's certain directors who are known as actors, directors, meaning they work so well and lovingly with their actors. And then there are other directors who are much more do this, do it like this. And, you know, and it's, it's that kind of stuff. I'm not that person. So yeah. my, my life is about the journey. It's about the people I'm with and, uh, and how much fun and joy and love can I get uh, from these experiences. Thanks, man. So we learned a lot today. Just to recap the three most important lessons. Secret to longevity is you have to be up for the challenge. That was yeah. classic. Yeah. Don't hang around with downers and don't <laughs> spend your money till it's in the bank. All yeah. very important. Yeah, I would think Fred. so. Thanks to Fred we, Mullen. We could have, we could have had a two minute interview and all those things would have been great. <laughs> there you go, man. Hey, let me tell people where to find you. Uh, if you're interested in uh, potentially working with Fred as a producer, and you said that several times, the word collaboration. And you know, what's interesting is that there are people in different music or acting that do want to be beat up on or, or that do need that. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah. It's I mean, interesting. I'm telling you, there are, there are people who look for the bully. Yeah. It's, it's just a different, totally different relationship and everything. But um, if you want to connect with Fred, go to his website. It's fredmolin.com. It's M-O-L-L-I-N. Uh, if you are interested in potentially working with him and having him produce you, go to the contact tab. Just be very detailed. You know, give him a, an explanation of what about his, why do you think you guys would be a fit? Send him some links so he could listen to some of your music. And, um, you know, just give him enough of a frame of reference that he could sit there and say, okay, let me listen. Let me go. I could answer this person back with a reasonable yeah. level of intelligence and competence. So you can go forward. Just don't say, Hey man, I think you want to, I think you'd be a great producer for my record. That's like going to get the lead. Well, and I, I also one thing I can suggest too. Yeah, um, please. If you, uh, write to me through the contact situation at my website, uh, I get a lot of spam. So um, it's important that, if possible, um, the way I know it's not spam is if you do two emails in a row. Great. So send two emails. Send two emails, and then I know, oh, this person is for real. It's not a spam. Right on. There you go. So send two emails, same thing. And um, thank you for your time. And check out also The Triangle by Lisa Mills on uh, Melody Place. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was really nice talking yeah. to you. You're a lovely guy, man. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Fred Mullen for sharing his time and energy with us. We appreciate it, man. And I hope this uh, virus ends so you can get outside and get some contact with loved ones. And uh, most important, remember, especially now, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or whatever it is you're doing and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank you so much, brother.